take action on climate emergency. But we also have a responsibility to do something ourselves, and we can start in our own backyards, and that was the same thing. So it's quite obvious what our objection, what our objective is, rather. We are trying to take Planidloys to zero carbon. So we look at the carbon footprint of Planet Voice and see if we can offset that in any way. But we also recognise the biodiversity crisis as well, so we try to do something on that. It's hard to know. It took us about a year to figure out what our carbon footprint is in Planet Voice. There's a great online tool which will tell you that, tell you literally for, for the area that you live in. And it's called the Impact um, Model, and you can access it through Exeter University. So if you put in your search engine of choice, Impact Model, Exeter University, it will give you some beautiful coloured diagrams, which I did try and send to Lottie, but they are rather big files to send over email. So you can see that for your own community, you can break it down into uh, where all the, the carbon is actually being generated. We did some sort of stress testing of the model, just, just to test whether we thought it was right. And, and actually, it's pretty good. It's as good as you're going to get. So do have a look at it. It's absolutely worthwhile. So Zero Carbon Planet Voice set off its work in December 2019. Had a lovely event at the Minerva Centre in Planet Voice. A really mixed event as well. So there were um, a lot of people there who did really different things. There was radical pottery. There was a siege uh, swap, there was um, talk about meadows, there was a big plan of the town and people were being asked what they wanted to see in the town. Uh, and there's a guy there who had a load of board games which promoted cooperation, you have to cooperate to win with them. So it's a really varied and really interesting event. Uh, and I can say that because I wasn't part of Zero Carbon Planet Lords at the time. I went along to avoid Christmas shopping, uh, just, before, just before Christmas. And then, of course, what came out of that was um, we collected £106 to set the organisation up, and a load of people's names who said they were interested. And then we went through Christmas, and then we went into Covid, and it's a bit of a common theme from a lot of people's presentations today. And we didn't quite know what to do next. Um, so what we did next was go on to Zoom. One thing with car Zero Carbon Planet Voice is, you know when you go to events and you fill in these forms and you say, yeah, I'll stay in touch, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in what you're doing, and no one ever contacts you again, do they? They do that in Zero Carbon Planet Voice. They ring you up and they say, you filled in this form. They don't say, are you still interested? They say, what are you going to do? What skills can you bring? What's your interest? And so what we... Well, don't touch that button either. Anyway. <laughs> so, done a whole load of things, and quite a lot of them we didn't even invent a logo for, um, but we've been involved in a lot of different things. I'll just walk you through some of those. This is where we're up to now. The Flanidloys Library of Things. How many things have you got in your garage, in your shed, in the cupboards in your kitchen that you bought or were given? And you've used them once, you've used them maybe a couple of times, you might use them once a year, you never use them again. They're taking up space. But somebody else probably wants to use them once or twice a year as well. So the library of things cools all those sorts of things. It cools carpet cleaners, it cools hay rakes, it cools all sorts of things that we only use every now and again. And instead of you buying them, instead of us all increasing our carbon footprint, instead of us all spending money, you can go and be part of the library things for nothing. And for a small amount of money, you can hire them out of there. You can clean the carpet, you can give it back. So that's what the library things is. It's fairly new for us, is that? We set up last year. Uh, it's already up, running, operational, and we just received from the Prince's Trust £20,000 to fund it through the next two years as well. So, other places have them, there's some great software behind that that you can get access to. Uh, you know, you're not alone, you're part of a much wider network when you do these things. And we've had some lovely donations as well, people donating their tools and things like that. Cuts down waste. The Flanidloys Futures Project, um, we did sort of follow our passions in, in many respects. 
in what we did in zero carbon. And a lot of the passions amongst the team is to get uh, community power into planet Plus. And we'd really like to see a community power cooperative working across the town. So the Planet Lois Futures project was um, a report, basically, that was produced out of, uh, out of the project. We got £9,000 funding. We managed to get some really great local expertise and people who uh, knew about, particularly solar power in the town, uh, and had installed it in the past, and some good project management as well. And we produced a report that I hope will allow us to get funds in the future. Because what it's done is a survey of the whole of Van Edwards. It's looked at all the roofs, it's looked at uh, community buildings, it's looked at housing, it's looked at um, where we've got preservation orders and you can't put any, any solar on roofs, things like that. And we've come up with a lot of areas where we can generate solar power, where we can put panels in. And where we've got big roofs, and community buildings in particular now. We've already talked to organisations like the Big Solar Co-op and got them involved with whoever owns those buildings so that we can put uh, solar on those uh, rooftops as well. Because if you're going to offset your carbon footprint, you can't necessarily always do that by putting in place um, the cooperative at first. What you can do though is generate that power and that power goes into the national grid. So we should at least mathematically be taking down the carbon footprint of that invoice uh, with this. The wool compost was another project. It's, it's had varied success, let's be honest. But um, I mean, I, I live up in the hills. I've had this year a whole stack of um, fleeces, particularly Welsh Mountain sheep fleeces just left on my doorstep. The first time they did it, I thought it was a dead animal. <laughs> it was absolutely terrifying. Oh, They're yes. beautiful, the Welsh Mountain Fleeces. They're beautiful colours. And farmers left them there because my neighbour, who is a farmer, said, well, Kay knows about wool. She knits. <laughs> well, it's a question. It could be you a fleece and, and you being able to knit from a ball of wool. But let's not go there. Um, so I end up with, with donkey bags full of these things. And I'm not, I'm not any different than a lot of people to go up in the hills. These fleeces are of no value. It costs the farmer more to shear the sheep than the value of that fleece. And when you look at the fleeces, they are beautiful. They're every colour. They're gold, they're brown, they're greys. I did give some of them to somebody who um, actually baked something out of, you know, she made cushion covers and things like that out of fleeces. Um, so I hope some of them have gone into people's homes. They don't have those sorts of skills. But the farmers obviously wanted something to come from those fleeces. And I mean, one of them said to me, well, it's either that or I burn them, Kate. I either burn them or, or, or I give them you. They can use them for compost in themselves, but um, Tamlin, who's at the back, is far more of an expert than I am. Wait, Tamlin? Uh, on the, the compost side. But bracken and wood, composted, uh, was what we were looking at, looking at the viability of it. There is one of our members who still has a large compost heap in his field of... Um, uh, of bracken and wool, and we've seen how that's going. We're really pleased that the Centre for Alternative Technology has taken this up and, and is doing their own experiments on it. We had a, a, we commissioned a report to look at it, um, which was funded through uh, Mentor uh, which is looking at Welsh wool and looking at how we actually get more value out of it. And um, I have to say that's where we had the mixed, uh, the mixed reaction, really because they weren't as enthusiastic as we felt about, um, about the market finally for it. And there are organisations who produce it. Dale Foot do this already in Yorkshire. Um, okay, so that's a sort of three of them. The, the other things that we've done, before I move on to Hay Meadows, uh, which I'm going to talk a bit more about, is um, the sort of things that you'd expect, the sort of things that you've probably already done in Newtown. We held big events where, for example, we did a seed swap in the morning and we had <coughs> uh, stalls up showing a lot of projects that we've been doing. Uh, there's a number of our leaflets over on the table there if you want to, to help yourselves to them afterwards. 
Uh, we had a community meal, and then what we did in the afternoon was we broke into groups and we decided what we wanted to see the future being in Planet Voice. And we came up with loads of different projects from the different groups and, and wrote them all on leaves and hung them on a tree. And then we look at grouping those together and we look at taking those forward. And the Library of Things was one of those. So we tried to bring people together, we tried to listen to what, uh, what they say and we're trying to move down those sorts of paths. Because if you're going to take a town to zero carbon, you also have to do what people want to do within that town to make it a more sustainable society and to, uh, to lower our carbon footprint. And the last one I'm going to talk about is making Welsh hay. So, <clears throat> when we were in lockdown, we started talking about the things that, that we we missed or that we really liked and, and Fran uh, from the Wilderness Trust talked about her childhood running through meadows and said you just don't see meadows anymore. You know, we, we, do, we deprive children of those and, and we've got less than 5% left of the meadows that we have. So we thought about how we do something around meadows and the biodiversity that meadows support. We had £106 in the bank. We filled in a load of forms. We wrote mathematical models about how we were going to spend this money in. We put our bid in with very little hope, let's be honest. Because we thought, there's 13 of us. We've got 106 quid. We've only been going for uh, the blink of an eye. Why would anyone give us any money? So we asked for 50 grand. We thought we should be ambitious. They gave us 20 grand. And we have made it really work over the last couple of years. So these pictures, sort of, that, this was just a one day. And this summarises <coughs> what we've tried to do over that time. So we've got equipment now for hay meadows. We've got size, we've got uh, the ability to keep those size in good order. We've got rakes, we've got pitchforks. Uh, we've worked with a great organisation. And you can see there that uh, there's been sizing and they've... Uh, um, Borrowed up a, a lot of the, uh, the grass at this side there, and that's Hand Powered UK. And Hand Powered UK are what they say they are, you know, it's about hand power to do these things. So they can teach you how to use a scythe without cutting your leg off. They can, or oh, hopefully not, anyway, they can teach you how to maintain your equipment, but they can teach you an awful lot more as well about these things. The meadow, if you just take a deep breath and imagine yourself there, the meadow that we went to. It's part of the wilderness trust. So you're on a really piece of high ground, you're on a ridge. And if you stand at the top of the ridge, all the land falls away and then comes up to the other hills in the sides of you. So you've got a, a hell of a view and you can see for an awful long way. At the top of the ridge, the highest point of the ridge, there's a big standing stone, a carved standing stone. And that gives a real presence to that land. What you've also got is a beautiful, diverse wildfire meadow. And, and is it one of the best? I'll be honest, no, it's probably not one of the best. We did a, a trip to um, Saoirse Lewis's meadows in the Ilan Valley. And if you want to really see a fabulous meadow, that is it. And what we've tried to do is emulate that. But what we've done is work with meadow owners elsewhere. We've taken cuts of their hay and put it onto this land so you get the seed from their land going into uh, a different location. It tries to bring the meadow along faster. Uh, we've put additional seed into these lands. We've got seed shares. Um, we started off this project with three meadows. The Wilderness Trust put in most of that land and then we had two other landowners that put in a small amount of land as well. We've now got, in two years, we've got 17 different meadows. We've got 40 acres, and they're in little bits across around and around Planet Woods. And we have a real possibility there, I think, to join up those bits of land and to make wildlife corridors and for each piece of land to feed on the other. They're a really diverse group of meadow owners as well. They are, there's some farmers who farm the land for donkey's years, all the way through to somebody who owns a wedding venue and wants a hay meadow there because it's, just, it's an outdoor wedding venue. You get married in, amongst the trees and you can have your photos taken there from the wildflower meadow. 
we've got the schools involved. So the day before this, there were 70 kids from the local schools running through that meadow. The, the grass is up to the top of their legs. And even though they live in a, in a very rural community, and some of their parents are farmers, they've never run through a wildlife meadow. And, and it is a fabulous location. You can just sit and, and watch the birds from the top of it. You can see that we had a kite and meadow festival. You can see the kites from the top of the, uh, um, the hill, the, the, the bird kites. But you can also take your own kite and, uh, and go, go fly a kite on the top of that. It's been a lovely evening with small kids who've never flown a kite before to 70 year olds who, who when you try to put a kite in their hand, said, oh no, I haven't done this for all, all right. Then, yeah. And then as soon as you feel the wind tug on it, you're in, aren't you? You're in. So we had a fabulous evening. We built a hay monster. We had music, we had, um, we had food, and it was just really lovely to see groups of people forming and just going and sitting amidst the meadow. So why was that sort of the highlight of it? I suppose because it brought together everything that we tried to do. We had puppet making, we had uh, the hay bales that, that you saw in the Montgomery Wildlife Trust uh, film, um, and the kids just jumping from hay bale to hay bale. I'm not sure we did a health and safety study, to be honest, for that one, but you know. So we had a fabulous time. But behind all of this is the work that we've done as well, looking at the diversity of the meadows, learning about the diversity of the meadows. The moth trapping event was my favourite thing, because I saw moths in real life that I've only ever seen in books before. And I can't tell you how wonderful that is. We had a fabulous time. We are going to do this again, even if we, our funding runs out. But we will do this again. And this will be in June um, at New Chapel uh, this year. So what are we doing next? Um, we've put in for some more funding for continuing our work with Hay Meadows. We've got to 17 meadows around there. We think we can do more. We've got probably the 18s just coming in now as well. The end of our project will be a number of meals that we're doing in the local communities. We're getting a lot of the farming communities together to talk about their history. One of the earliest speakers talked about uh, having a meadow that you put your cows into. And it's, it's much better. Um, it's much better food for them. It's uh, it's more healing for them. Uh, and there's a number of hospital meadows as well, whole hospital meadows that we hope might come into the project as well. Hospital meadows are way for the sheep to try and uh, recover before antibiotics, we're just stuck before antibiotics. So we're doing some work on the hay meadows, we're full full throttle uh, on the internet, on see the internet of things, on the library of things. And um, you know, we're keeping going on the other projects as well. We're trying to form Flanny Energy Club now, so that we can take the project forward to try and uh, decarbonise the energy into Flanny Boys and have community energy. And I think the one thing that we have learned through all of this is the value of the Wildlife Trust. And I don't want to embarrass, embarrass but I will do. Um, the knowledge in the Wildlife Trust, we could not have managed without the knowledge of the Wildlife Trust. We made mistakes, but they sort us out. And, and one of the mistakes we made, for example, is we sent people in to Meadows to do um, recognition of grasses. And um, Kate Hodgson and I thought, okay, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll photograph, uh, we'll photocopy some sheets of grasses. We'll just do it in black and white because, you know, uh, the grass is green and really you're looking at what the stem looks like and the seed looks like. And everybody got into the field and went, grass is yellow, grass is mauve, grass is purple, grass is all sorts of colours of brown. So we've learned a lot from the wildlife trust. Um, they've attended all our meetings. And they've been an absolutely wonderful support. They are fabulous people to work with. So uh, you know, our, our gratitude stays with you. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you.